Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this, the second meeting of 2016 of the Public Petitions Committee. Can I ask everyone who's present, including members, to switch off the mobile phones and Blackberries, etc., uh, because it can interfere with the sound system? We go to our agenda item one, which is consideration of new petitions. The first new petition is PE 1595 by Alexander Taylor on a moratorium on shared space schemes. Members have a note by the clerk, the petition itself, the spice briefing and a number of submissions in support of the petition. I would also highlight to members that some wording was inadvertently missed out in the petition and that the action it calls for is a moratorium on all shared space schemes until safety and equality concerns have been addressed. So I welcome the petitioner Alexander Taylor to our meeting this morning. Great to have you here uh, this morning, Mr. Taylor. Uh, he's accompanied today by Margaret Hutchison and I invite Mr. Taylor to speak to this petition and then we'll ask questions and discuss the issues that you raise. But over to you, uh, Mr. Taylor. Uh, good morning, everyone. First of all, I'd like to th thank the uh, staff, petition staff, who have been most helpful throughout. And I would like to thank uh, or to commend the Scottish Parliament on uh, our democracy and allowing me to be here today to put my petition to you. If I may, I'd like to sort of go back uh, to why we got here today. But you, you've obviously been briefed on shared space. Uh, if you can bear with me, gentlemen, I've got a prompter here, so. Yes, when I say I um, commend you for your democracy, <laughs> conversely, um, ironically, I'm here really to complain about the lack of democracy in local government. Uh, shared s these councils have imposed these schemes on local communities against the wishes of the vast majority of the people. Shared space has been described recently as the biggest systematic institutionalised discrimination against blind people ever seen in the UK. Now that is quite a statement um, and uh, Lord Chris Holmes you may be aware has come up with a report recently uh, telling us that 35% of the public avoid towns or areas where shared space are in place. Now, where we are at at the moment, gentlemen, we can make our way around our town blind people, uh, visibly impaired people, disabled people, those with uh, dementia and other disabilities. We can make our way around our towns perfectly well at the moment. Me using a cane, Margaret here with her guide dog, and other people can cross the road safely by pressing the button. We've all been brought up with the Green Cross code. There are many people with dementia who rely on this and the council proposed to remove all signals, traffic signals, all pedestrian crossings, safety railings, road markings and in some cases curbs and pavements and replace it with courtesy crossings. Now courtesy crossings are a raised section where people can cross the road hopefully safely but I'm afraid to say we don't believe or we certainly wouldn't want to use these crossings. Um, the, the traffic are under no legal obligation to stop at these crossings and if you can imagine traffic, the, the, the electric cars are there now, silent. I would not be so irresponsible or stupid as to put my foot on the carriageway totally unaware of what is travelling in either direction. And I am being denied access to my town centre. This, I claim, is in uh, breach of my equal rights. The council, I claim, are in breach of their uh, public sector equality duty because we can no longer access our town centre. And I say there are many, many people who are excluded, not simply the blind, uh, there are many other disabled people. Bear with me a moment. I 
I'm sorry, gentlemen, my technology is... Uh, um, we have been talking to the Council over the past 18 months, and we have constantly told them of our safety fears. They haven't listened to anything we've had to say. Now, these schemes are coming about because councils are getting funding via the government through sustrans, and there are strings attached to the money. They, it is, seems to be imperative that councils put in a shared space scheme, which I say it means, means removing traffic lights, etc. Um, and councils are so desperate to get these funds that they will do almost anything. And we are seen as a real problem. Uh, we've told them that we are unhappy about crossing the road. We will not use those junctions, those, those uh, crossing points, because they are simply unsafe. It's like playing Russian roulette, trying to cross the road in front of traffic. Now, this, these schemes are all over the country now, as I'm sure you're aware. There have been accidents uh, aplenty, hundreds of them. My colleague Sarah Gayton has put a submission in, uh, and she had uh, links to so many of these accidents, which were left out, but hopefully we can get them to you if, if you need them. She also made a film on uh, shared space. So the, the, say the accidents are aplenty. That's why we're concerned about the safety issue. Um, I'm sorry, I say my technology is not working this morning. Um, now, Scotland has a unique opportunity to go it alone here, follow their own policies. We, we are aware that um, the, Scotland wants to give disabled people equal rights. That is, that is our right. And we, we demand it. Uh, I say we, we are not going to be treated like second-class citizens, that we will no longer go near our town centres. The, the, the lack of consultation, I'm afraid, that the councils have claimed that they, we've been consulted all the way along the line. That just did not happen, I'm afraid. We were part of a group, which was the Equality Design, Design Forum. Now, there was two meetings of this group. We were there to discuss um, paving materials, curbing materials, and the council make a big play that we were so influential. We made absolutely no difference to that scheme whatsoever. We were never consulted. It was a fait accompli all the way through. I know other councils where construction work actually started before the public were aware of what was happening. There's a scheme recently opened in Kinross, for instance, and the traffic are going through there at over 40 miles per hour. People are frightened to come out of their houses. The kids have to do a big detour uh, to, to go to and from their nursery school. Um, there's a, a scheme in Dumfries where Margaret has a colleague with a guide dog down there. She can no longer access her town centre. A dog is totally confused. There's cars parked all over the place. There's all sorts of problems. And this is, this is reflected throughout the country. These schemes are not a success anywhere, despite what the, the many people claim. So I would hope, gentlemen, that, that you will listen to the, the um, submissions, read them. Uh, they're from guide dogs. They're from... Uh, of the wild, RNIB, RNIB, inclusion, you know, Scotland. inclusion Scotland, all, all the influential people, yeah, but well. the public as well have written many letters, very, very concerned for their safety. They are being denied access to the town centre, and we believe that we are, we are being discriminated against. I would hope that you will listen to my petition and act upon it. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Mr. Taylor. <clears throat> you covered a lot of areas that I was uh, particularly interested in, in in relation to the amount of consultation that takes place, because when there has been town centre redevelopments in my own area, um, the, the local authority, as you said, has made great play of the fact that they've discussed with local disability groups and um, with the wider community and tried to get as much consultation on the, the, the layout of those new town centres. Um, 
but I, I, I got to be honest with you, I've not had the, the level of concern raised with me that appears to be driving your petition. Um, is this something that, that's peculiar to some local authorities and not others? Um, and I know your eastern Bartonshire area. I'm talking about north and, and south Lanarkshire, the, the area that I cover. Um, I've not had, I mean, I've had people raising concerns with me about the, the developments in town centres, but not so much in relation to the accessibility. I think in each case that, that's uh, occurred in my area, accessibility has improved. So I'm just wondering if, um, if this is peculiar to specific local authorities rather than, than right across the country. It does appear to be across the country because unless there is a controlled crossing there, uh, you know, we, we cannot cross the road safely. In, in the proposed scheme for Kirkintilly, for instance, there will be one crossing at the extreme south end, one control crossing at the extreme south end of the scheme. Uh, if I were at the other end of the town and wanted to cross the road, I would have to take a detour of about half a mile to be able to get a controlled crossing to cross the road. I would not use anything other than a controlled crossing. And so that, that's the case for many, many people. I mean, I, I think your point regarding um, local authorities, um, each one is allowed to interpret their schemes um, as to how they think appropriate. But I would say that the problems faced by us in um, Kirk and Tillich, if, if you're blind or if you're disabled, if you're deafblind, are going to be exactly the same um, as in... Kinross or whatever. I mean, I, I have been trained um, with my guide dog. Um, I've, I'm a resident of this town, born and brought up. I've been able to um, walk around my town, get there independently um, with the use of my guide dog. Um, I walk nearly everywhere, and because of this scheme, um, I can't do that anymore. They're confusing my dog. My dog's only been trained for um, just under a year. He is trained specifically to... Part of our training is for him to find the pole, to find the traffic, uh, you know, the controlled crossing pole, so that we know where to go. Um, I then um, use the cone that's underneath to let me know... Um, that the green light is on because although I've got a little bit of sight, um, I still can't see whether the green man's on or not. Sandy's got absolutely no sight whatsoever. So he sees absolutely nothing. Everything's black. Um, so he, he needs that. Other people with... We've got a lady in our group who's like Sandy, has a guide dog. She needs... These dogs have been trained to do that. They've also been trained that if they walk out in the, in the middle of the road and there's any moving vehicle coming, that they stop. So I literally could be stuck in the middle of the road with traffic coming from four um, different directions. And I, and I, I feel that um, I've had, I face challenges, as Sandy does, every single day of my life. I really don't need... Um, this to make my life more difficult because I'm a, a citizen, a, um, a resident of that area and I'm, I'm entitled to be able to walk down the street um, the same as anybody else and have reasonable access um, to my town centre. Whereas under this present scheme, our um, council um, deem it that it is reasonable for myself, for Sandy, who's totally blind, to access the town, take a longer detour to get across the town um, safely, um, which I don't think that's... Um, the council is um, bound to make reasonable adjustments um, to enable us to go safely across the road, whereas their adjustments actually make it a, a more longer circuitous um, route for us to go. And also they have not listened to anything we've said about crossing the main shopping area. Um, and the consultation, as Sandy had said before, has really been 
hasn't been meaningful in that in the very first instance we only found out about this traffic scheme um, by accident purely by accident the council have never um, provided any documentation or details of the plans and formats that that we could read or know about any consultation with other um, groups like guide dogs um, it wasn't um, by them we were the one that insisted uh, so really for the, our council to say that they've consulted really is is not um, true they consulted after we insisted that they um, consulted the, the, the consultation was a sham it really was the, the um, council had already okay. made up their mind what they were doing Oh, uh, your experience, I'm just trying to establish just how widespread this might be, given that I've not had any over, experience is, of yeah. this myself. Um, yeah. I'll open up to colleagues who might want to ask. The country and councils are having to do U-turns uh, to reinstall controlled crossings because the system doesn't work. And, and it's a very one. costly affair to uh, have to I'll put in. Angus, yeah, I'm going to take other questions, uh, Mr Jack, uh, Taylor. Yep. I'll go to Angus McDonald first to be followed by Jackson Carlo. Okay, uh, thanks, Convener. Um, good morning, uh, Ms Hutchison. Good morning, Mr Taylor. Um, you, you mentioned uh, the lack of democracy in, in local authorities, and I have to say I have some sympathy uh, with that, given the situation in, in my, my neck of the woods in, in recent years. However, I have to say, in my days as a, a local councillor, um, I, I saw plans submitted for a, a major housing application, a housing development with hundreds of houses, um, leading eventually into thousands of houses which intended to introduce, introduce a Dutch style uh, living streets with, with no curbs, for example. Uh, however, following consultation, um, these plans were later ditched, uh, a U-turn, if you like, uh, as, as you mentioned earlier. Um, that said, though, um, I mean, the responsibility it does lie with, uh, with local authorities. So, I mean, do you, do you not feel that, that the interpretation and application of these policies set out in the Designing Streets uh, documents and, and uh, any other associated UK guidance is a, is a matter for, for individual planning authorities when drafting development plans um, or deciding the applications for planning permission? Because clearly it can be classed as a material consideration uh, when uh, a planning application uh, comes up. Well, I, I've studied the designing streets. There isn't a great deal in there on the rights of people who have uh, sight loss, etc. But there are, it does state that uh, provision must be made. In other words, we must have controlled crossings. Blind people must have controlled crossings. If the, the, the Scottish Transport uh, no longer recommend uh, zebra crossings for the very reason that visibly impaired people cannot be sure that the traffic has stopped. Well, surely at least a zebra crossing has uh, a legal compulsion on a driver to stop, whereas these courtesy crossings have not. But it is clear in various documents um, that uh, for blind and disabled people, there must be an alternative means of crossing the road and my council are not providing that alternative. It's either a um, courtesy crossing or nothing. Just for clarification, when you heard of, the, of your council's plans, um, had the planning approval already been granted? Because you did say that you could, you could still submit uh, your views to a consultation that happened later. Was that after the planning permission was granted or beforehand? The planning permission was granted on the 30th of April. Since then, they've, they formed this um, design forum, quality design forum, rather badly named, I have to say. But there was, there was no... The consultation was over minor items, you know, like paving materials, um, tactile marking. Or I say relatively minor, minor. They are important, nevertheless. But the major decisions had all been made. Putting words in your mouth, they were just ticking a box. Yes, yeah. it has been a, absolutely a box-ticking exercise. 
Okay, just um, and they, they've, I mean, they've ticked the boxes, but if you read the Equality Impact Assessment Report, you would think that they had done a great deal of consulting. I'm afraid that is not the case. No meaningful uh, consultation took place because they did not listen to any of our safety concerns. And if, if someone ex expects me to take a chance in crossing at one of those uh, courtesy crossings, I'm afraid I'm much mistaken. My, my life is a bit more valuable than that. I think one of the big problems with designing streets is that these are guidelines and uh, back to what you're saying about interpretation. But our, our council, you know, have on several occasions said to us, but these are only guidelines. And our problem is, what if, as in our case, um, the council don't actually do the recommended guidelines in um, designing streets? Where is the recourse um, for us? Um, I mean, we're talking some like five years down the line from the Curtin Tillock Master Plan um, before we were even um, consulted um, about it. So I, I think the big problem really is that there is no um, regulation of um, councils. They seem to be able to have carte blanche to do um, whatever. Sir Strand seemed to be the driving force behind all of these schemes. And also in Eastern Bartonshire, you may or may not have heard about cycle lanes in Mulgai and Bears Den. And, and these apparently are a disaster, absolute disaster. Uh, the local inhabitants are uh, uh, rebelling at the moment on that one. So, uh, say, Sir Strand seemed to be the driving force um, in putting all of these schemes in. And I say, all, all we're asking for all we're asking for is a safe means of crossing our main street. That means, I'm afraid, that means safe puffin crossings. If people, if people, able-bodied people want to use these uh, courtesy crossings, that's fine. Just give us suitable, controlled crossings that we're used to at the moment, that not just blind people, I, I, I keep saying this, there are a lot of other people who are being affected, and drivers also. Um, are, are not happy about the situation because someone could step out right in front of them and it's not their fault. I mean, there was a, a nine-year-old girl killed in Swindon and she was blamed for her own death because she thought that she had a priority at crossing one of those uh, courtesy crossings. And this has happened all over the place. Yeah, because the councils tell them that. Our council tell us that we have priority at one of those courtesy crossing. In law, that is not the case. Um, we, we have uh, some examples of the, 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 the Wunerf concept, I think that's the way to pronounce it, in, in the Netherlands, which seems to, seems to work. Um, have you contacted any blind charities, for example, in Holland uh, to, yeah, to ask? Well, no, to... I, I personally haven't, but uh, I mean, even, even the Dutch people are falling out of love with airspace. There have been in since the 70s. Sorry? They've been, they've been introduced since the 70s, yeah. I believe. Oh, yes, yes. Yes, but I see... The, the I mean, I have a friend from the, the Netherlands, and he, he has said that all of these schemes were um, put in for the environment. They weren't done in retrospect, which all the ones here. Even, um, I can't remember the chap's name, who was the first proponent of shared space schemes, said that these, his schemes were designed for quiet residential areas and not for busy urban areas. And the very first one that was actually put in Holland happened to be outside a school, a residential school for blind children. And when that first shared space scheme was put into being, they bust the children to school because of the safety implications. Okay, thank you. Uh, to be followed by Hans Auer. Okay, thank you. Good, good morning to you both. And I have two or three questions, and I'm conscious of time, so if, if you can try and be concise, that would be helpful. To help facilitate the discussion and my understanding of it in the first instance, and I know you're here representing the argument against shared spaces, but what is the problem that shared spaces is designed to solve? 
Well, we've been told various things. First of all, we were told it was to speed the traffic up. Then we were told it was to speed the traffic, to, to slow the traffic down. We were told also that it was an environmental situation, a uh, green issue. Um, but as Margaret said earlier, you know, we have a very low uh, carbon footprint. It's going to increase under the scheme. Would your position in the first instance be that whatever the merits are otherwise of shared spaces, it's not clear that there is a simple public definition of what the public good is that it is trying to serve? Yes. We're aware that Sustrans uh, champion uh, the cyclist, the pedestrian and public transport, but largely the cyclist. We understand that the Scottish Government are looking for 10% of journeys to be done by bicycle by 2020. Um, but the, you know, it is an environmental issue, I, from my point of view, yes. From, I looked through, there's lots of good submissions, uh, powerful submissions in support of your petition. I, I'm trying to understand, it, 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 initially, the, and in fact, um, Angus MacDonald's question almost supported the view that these shared spaces were things that were associated with new developments. What you're talking about here, as I understand it, is a as they fit retrospectively into, uh, uh, into Kirkintilloch. Out, out of interest, where in Kirkintilloch? So because I, I, mean, I know the town. So uh, the main street that runs right through the centre of the town. Right. There and is a four-way junction at that point. Right. And so, if you were illustrating. And I know this is maybe asking you to be expansive, but if you could try to be concise. If you were illustrating it for the benefit of the committee just now, how does this street look just now? And how will it look with the imposition of this shared spaces scheme? What will the key differences be well, that I would notice or anybody here would notice between now and the fit of the shared spaces scheme? The cosmetic improvements of that, there is no doubt. And we, we support that. But basically, all the traffic lights... All the safety railings, all the pedestrian crossings will be removed. So you could say there will be less clutter, perhaps, but at what cost? Right. And uh, that's the cost of safety. Yeah. And, you, and, and also the cost of uh, us being denied access to a town. Do you know how many uh, such schemes of a retrospective fit n nature similar to the one you're describing being proposed for a busy main part of Kirk and Tillich are proposed elsewhere in Scotland? I mean, if you've got wider knowledge of, of, of how many of these schemes are, are immediately... I believe there are around 10 in Scotland at the moment. I'm, I may be in wrong place. on that. But, uh, sorry? 10 in place just now? Well, the, well, yes, at least 10, yes. Oh, Dumfries, okay. Dumfries, let's say there's a new one just gone in, in Kinross at the end of last year. Uh, there's some in Inverness, Aberdeen. Um, there, there is a proposed scheme for Inverness, I believe, costing £11 million. Uh, they've already spent over a million pounds in consultation fees there. Um, there are a number of minor schemes around, but Kirk and Tillich is a busy main street. I understand that. Um, you have amongst your submissions, and forgive me for not knowing him, but who is the Lord Holmes of Richmond? Lord Chris Holmes is a blind former Paralympian uh, who... I should have already put that to you, but he came up with a Holmes report yes, called the Accident... The mission and his reference to right. it. I was just trying Accident. to understand a bit more about him. Right, yep. He had a debate in the okay. House of Lords on the 15th of October, um, and there were many people who supported uh, his call for a, a national moratorium on shared space schemes until safety and equality issues have been... Uh, so his report draws out experience of these schemes across oh. the whole of the United Kingdom, is that yes. correct? Yes. He also did a survey amongst blind um, people um, as to um, the impact that these sort of schemes um, would have on them and that actually said that the majority of them would no longer um, come out, um, that they would actually retrospectively um, be back in their own houses again. They had had their freedom before, but now that was getting denied. They were frightened and insecure um, because of that. And just finally then, is the conclusion of his report and the principle underpinning your submission 
not against shared spaces in principle, or is it? Or is it that you are looking for the shared spaces scheme to include specific guidance and regulations which protect the interests of uh, partially or uh, blind people? Is that, is that the... Disabled people in general. Disabled we, people we, in general. Yeah, we, we, we demand that we must have controlled crossings. Yeah. Uh, I think I, that's fine. Thank you very much. That's it. Control crossings is the key. John Wilson. Morning. I know Kirkintilla fairly well, and I know the, high, the main street that you're referring to, and the crossing at the south end of the main street. Uh, has there been any discussion with the local authority regarding why they've went for this option rather than a full pedestrianisation of the main street? Because one of the issues that I have is that I know there's been a number of local authorities introduced the shared street scheme. But the difficulty is, is that pedestrians, particularly those with, uh, who are visually impaired or with other disabilities, don't fully understand, it's not fully explained to them what level of access vehicles may have on those sh shared streets. So was there any discussion about ped full pedestrianisation? Yes, there has been, it was, and it was rejected. They said that shopkeepers didn't want it, but the main reason is that the bus people who are putting money into this scheme want to retain it as a route, bus route. That is the main reason. But, you know, we as blind people and other disabled people, we're fully aware of what a, a, a courtesy crossing is. We're fully aware of what the repercussions will be when they remove the traffic lights, because there was a trial went on for a month. Right? They, took, they switched off the traffic lights, they took away all the railings for a month and utter chaos ensued. There were near fights, there were so many near misses. People stayed away from the town. Shop, shops were down 25 to 30 per cent in turnover. People kept away. I mean, there were four options um, for the council to choose from. One, total pedestrianisation. One with controlled crossings in, the one that it was just now, I can't remember what the other one was. These were all discussed by the council and then put before the council, full council again, and they opted for um, the, the present one, which was the cheapest option. Yeah, but I mean, I say Sustrans are the driving force and they they want shared space. It is a concept that they want. It's, it's the flavour of the month. It's happening all over the country. I understand the courtesy crossings only operate if drivers and others are prepared to show courtesy to pedestrians. And, and sometimes the, the, some drivers forget not only to be courteous in terms of these crossings, but also in relation to other crossings. I'm intrigued by the, the argument the, the council put forward uh, based on the shopkeepers uh, claiming that they didn't want full pedestrianisation in this area because my understanding is there is very limited street parking in the main street in Kirkintilloch. Uh, I know there is a problem with the car parking availability in the town centre uh, with the main car park being outside the Tesco superstore or the small Tesco store uh, just off the, the main street. Uh, so it's really it's one where have the council proposed to introduce speed restrictions on the vehicles that are going through the town centre because there's no point in having a semi-pedestrianised area if you've still got the volume of traffic travelling through the main street at the same speeds that they're currently travelling traveling through. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the shared space you know, or sorry, using those custody, courtesy crossings means making eye contact with drivers. Now, clearly, we can't do that. You know, we, we cannot make eye contact with anyone to get the nod to, to say, yes, you can cross the road now. So neither many people in wheelchairs also, they're too low down. If it's very sunny, they can't make eye contact. Um, there are all sorts of problems. But as a former retailer uh, who had a shop in Kirkintilloch, that Parking has always been a problem in Kirkintilloch and remains so today. No further questions. Well, that has exhausted the questions, Mr Taylor and Ms Hutchison. Um, we need to decide how we're going to take this petition forward, so I'm open to suggestions from colleagues about who we should contact to 
to make inquiries. Jackson. I have a number of suggestions, Convener. I would be quite interested if we were able to contact Lord Holmes uh, to establish what the reaction has been to his report and also to the debate that took place from the UK Government to see whether that has led to any uh, practical suggestions or actions. Um, I would be quite interested to write to the councils that have been advised today as having schemes or considering schemes just to understand what the motivation uh, was for the uh, the proposal and the process and consultation that they understood took place. And I would also be quite interested to write to the Scottish Government because it does appear that there's been no review of designing streets since it was introduced in 2010. And I note in December a response from the Cabinet Secretary uh, to a point raised by Dennis Robertson, our colleague, where he said that the issue raised is valid and every planning authority, indeed every department of every authority, including central government, should take full account of it. Now, in, in a way, that's a call to arms without actually an instruction to anything specific. And, and I would be interested to know whether the government feel in the light of the petition and whatever experience there's been, that there might not be a need for something a little bit more comprehensive in terms of a guideline or an instruction around which councils might be operating and imposing or, or consulting in these schemes. Yeah, yeah I agree with that. Um, I think we should also contact the local authority organisations, uh, the heads of planning across our, uh, all our local authorities to see if we can get a, an overview of that, Angus, and then David. Um, Convener, I'm just wondering if it would be possible to contact um, the equivalent of COSLA in the Netherlands to find out how um, they addressed the, the, the issue uh, when they were introducing the, the, the Winner concept, if, if that's possible. If it's possible, I think that's a, a reasonable suggestion. If there's e examples of from elsewhere, we should always try and tap into that, David. Um, can we write to Sistrans as well? If they're pushing these schemes, uh, can we ask our views on what uh, open spaces and con co controlled crossings are? Yeah, yeah I think they're all uh, good suggestions. And just to add, I think we also, although we've had, as, as Mr Taylor said, uh, contributions to the, the petition from some disability organisations, normally uh, the Scottish Government and others would contact Max um, to, to discuss these issues. And I think it might be worthwhile asking for their view, given that they are a, a consultee in, in almost all of these. Uh, if they're not, they should be. Um, and also the Royal Town Planning Institute for Scotland, uh, who must have a take on this as well, that would be worth uh, trying to establish. Any other suggestions? No. Well, what we'll do then, Mr Taylor, is we'll contact all of those organisations. We'll compile their responses and we'll contact you to let you know uh, what those responses are and you can respond to them and make comments on the information that we get back and we'll have a look again at the petition in due course and see how we can take it forward. But thanks very much this Gee, morning uh, for uh, one, one your evidence. One thing I forgot to say, gentlemen, was that there are three councils down in England about to be taken to court on equality grounds. I'll keep an eye out on that yep. as well and, and see if, if there's any progress in relation to the legalities of it uh, from that point of view. But thanks very much for the information you've brought in for the petition this morning. OK, I'll suspend for a couple of minutes to allow witnesses to change over.
next petition this morning is PE1596 by Chris Daly, Paul Anderson and James McDermott on In Care Survivor Services Scotland. Members have a note from the clerk, the petition itself and the spice briefing. And I welcome uh, Chris Daly and Paul Anderson to the meeting and invite Mr Daly to speak to the petition for a few minutes and then we'll discuss uh, the issues that you've raised with us this morning. Over to you, Mr Daly. Um, convener, um, we were going to try and uh, split just our brief opening statement uh, between Paul and I. Thank you. Um, good morning, convener and committee members. I'm Chris Daly, and my colleague here is Paul Anderson. We are service users of In Care Survivor Service Scotland. Thank you for inviting us to present our petition, which is In Care Survivor Service Scotland. For some time now, we survivors or care experienced in Scotland have been engaged in an interaction process with the Scottish Government, Celsus, and the Scottish Human Rights Commission, and also service providers. We key stakeholders have worked together to come to a consensus on remedies to in-care abuse. It has been challenging. However, we have made progress through having thematic discussions and local engagement events throughout Scotland. At these events, we worked cohesively on the issues including public inquiry, support fund, time bar and other legal aspects. Working together, we have managed to address the issues and come to a consensus on most of the issues or remedies. The Scottish Human Rights Commission's framework of 2010, which was the remedies to in-care historic abuse in Scotland, has underpinned the themes and the interaction process. The Scottish Government made a number of commitments addressing the public inquiry, time bar, the support fund, Regrettably, however, the issue of compensation has not been addressed. Today, we raise these matters to ask the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to support the continuation of the in-care survivor service Scotland in the context of the new service model. We are concerned about the uncertainty about the continuation of in-care survivor service Scotland and the distress that this is causing us survivors. I would like to outline briefly the issues that pre present us with challenges to continuing the positive journey towards ameliorating some of the hardships and challenges met by care experienced in their day-to-day -day lives. The current ICSSS model has been running for seven years now and is a person-centred integrative approach with therapeutically trained staff. It has provided vital services for survivors of in-care abuse and is highly valued by those who use its service. In-Care Survivor Service Scotland provides an intensive person-centred service and takes the service to survivors. The new broker model has some very positive aspects that survivors welcome. The commitment of £13.5 million over five years is significant, and the range of issues to be addressed – education, employment, accommodation and physical health, as well as mental health – is something that survivors have been drawing attention to for some years now. We consider that the new brokering model has the scope to embrace the work of In Care Survivor Service Scotland as a specialist contribution to the needs of survivors. And this would allow the continuation of the valued ICSSS services. With this approach, we feel that there is less potential for harm caused by the disruption of services. Another contention we have is with transitioning of service users and ownership of client files or case notes. There has been an order to In Care Survivor Service Scotland to hand over all client records 
in order that the new brokering service can risk assess individual clients. Our understanding is that legal ownership of the files is the client's. This needs to be clarified as survivors, service users of ICSSS have raised concerns with the petitioners that confidential, highly sensitive case files are to be passed around. We Care Experience have had some difficulty with care and treatment under the NHS model. Labels of borderline personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder have been unhelpful. And we understand that clinicians are currently working on specific diagnostic labelling for historic abuse survivors. Hopefully this will help in the future care and treatment. The petitioners offer this from a person working in the field of trauma. If we say it's fear and sadness from legacies of this better explains a natural human reaction to being traumatised. If we look back at the brilliant interaction process of CELSUS and the Scottish Human Rights Commission, we had not been consulted on by Scottish Government or during the interaction on the ICSSS losing funding in March this year. We understand the service would continue, or we understood the service would continue and would enhance the new service and uh, vice versa. We believe that the essential dedicated service and the team of development workers could be a key component of the Survivor Support Fund Service or new brokering model. In Care Survivor Service Scotland and its team are an essential element to survivors leading full, healthy and independent lives. The Scottish Government talk of an enhanced, expanded service. The relationship within Care Survivor Service and the new brokering model could be a symbiotic one both enhancing the new brokering model. It's also about survivor choice, with survivors being enabled, enabled to strive and thrive. Essentially, it's about the best possible outcomes for us survivors. Over the seven years, survivors have grown to trust ICSSS. For some, this has been the only continuity of support. Most importantly, it's saving lives in times of crisis. Safety and security is at the heart of what ICSSS provide. The continuation of the counselling and emotional support by In Care Survivor Service Scotland would be the best way of managing transitions and enhancing the package on offer to survivors. I just wanted to to cover um, before I hand over to Paul. We've already had about oh, 10 no, minutes sorry. and you're severely okay. eating into the amount of time it's going to be available to, to colleagues to ask okay. questions. So if you want to pass to Mr Anderson, okay. you're really going to start eating um, further into that. And if you want to continue adding to your own statement, you're curtailing the amount of time okay. that we've got to, uh, to get into an understanding of the situation. But um, if you want to make the point... The, the issues are... Um, complex and the, there are I understand many that, but to them. Asking questions can get into the complexity of that. We don't have to hear everything Thank in, in a statement. Um, I'll, I'll hand over to Paul now for, okay. for a short statement from Paul. And his statement is more of a personal slant on uh, using the service. That's fine. Convener, Michael McMartin, thank you and everyone here for giving me the chance to speak. I am a survivor of child abuse. Um, I have in front of me here a dossier which is composed of 19 letters from people all over Scotland from different professions supporting the In Care Survivors funding. And one of those letters is from Police Scotland, whom I asked to have a meeting with, with our group. And the letter outlines clearly the absolute importance that the funding continue for survivors. <clears throat> I would like now to outline how I feel. <clears throat> Among those letters are from the Right Honourable Lord Provost of Edinburgh, Donald Wilson, the Chair of the Scottish Human Rights Commission, Professor Alan Miller, 
Head of Social Work in Stirling and Clerk Manager Val de Souza and Vox Scotland to quote, by bringing your own experiences to ensure the emotional aspect remains at the forefront of decision making. In Care Survivor Service Scotland, survivors and myself, they treat us as human beings. There is no price anyone can put in what that means to us as survivors. Where I live in Kirkintilloch, there are no services for me. I've knocked on many doors and been refused help. I have a letter in this dossier from my councillor in Eastern Bartonshire Council confirming that there are no services for me there. <clears throat> I know of one survivor in the borders who cannot access any services either in the same position as I am. The NHS have informed me that I will not be given CBT because it won't work. I've also been informed that I will not get psychotherapy because I had it before and it failed. Now I was told this after another suicide attempt and if I have another episode I've basically been told by the NHS I will get one hour's help, nothing more. <clears throat> When I've been in crisis for a while with the InCare Survivor Service Scotland, all I've had to do is pick up the phone and someone is there. I've not had to wait for a GP appointment. I've not had to wait on the list to see a counsellor or a psychiatrist. The broker model would give what they want, what the survivors want for the broker model, and that's fine. But unfortunately, they can only give a limited period of time for counselling, perhaps up to 12 weeks. If this is true, it would be wrong to expect the survivors to trust that broker model system, because how long do you expect, or how short a time can you expect survivors to trust a new counsellor to talk about, of all things, child abuse? Is there anybody in this audience or anyone that you know of that would trust a new counsellor that quickly if you were being abused? I have borderline personality disorder, which is untreatable. I've been told that. I also have post-traumatic stress disorder, among other things. The, we also have group therapy within the in-care survivors, and it's provided me with friends to empathise with other survivors and their trauma. And it helps us to value each other's experiences. The survivors within ICSSS trust their counsellors and therapists. It's taken a long time for them to do this. The counsellors already have the long-term experience of listening to survivors. Would it not make sense to give the in-care survivors counsellors the jobs with the broker model that was originally agreed? This would save time and expenditure. The loss of in-care survivors for myself and others is devastating. I've lost count as to how many times I've cried about this and how much sleep I've lost. I'm on more medication now because my heart is in trouble. The Scottish Government does have a duty of care to provide the best possible care for the most vulnerable people that live in our country. Some may even be just outside this building. I make this appeal to you for help. The Scottish Government knows that survivors of in-care survivors love the service. And so does Survivor Scotland. The ICSSS is working. Look at all the evidence from professionals who support the service. It's not broken. It doesn't need to be fixed. One size doesn't fit all. And that's right, it doesn't. The in-care survivor service is good for them. The broker model is good for them. Hence, one size doesn't fit all. I want to put this to all of you, those who may be watching this broadcast also. That I believe that the broker model is a good service. It provides help in ways that the in-care survivors can't. But also, the in-care survivors can provide services the broker model can't. Please, allow the broker model and the in-care survivor service to work together. They can enhance each other. The potential for lives being saved is likely to be the greatest Scotland will see in its history 
of helping survivors of child abuse. To Mr. Daly, Mr. Anderson, for for giving us that information. I mean, it's obvious that there's a, a very valuable service that is uh, available at the moment, and you're genuinely concerned that that could be at risk uh, through uh, reductions in funding. I'm just wondering, to, to start the questions, are you aware if the number of people accessing this service is increasing or, or decreasing at the, the present time? Not necessarily the length of time that people are be, who are already receiving this, the services are continuing, but is the number of people entering into counselling, <coughs> is it on the increase or has it been falling as people have gone through the service? Information. The I have no facts here. This is just what I, I've picked up. But because the funding is going to stop, no more referrals would be made. So therefore, the statistics, I think, have now been stable. I'm not entirely sure what that figure is, but it might well be over 900 through the in-care survivors. So it's not a reduction in the funding, it's a complete cessation of the funding, is that correct? I understand it, yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Can I add something? Are, are you aware of anything that's, that's been recommended to replace it and the, the funding has been redirected towards that? Is there anything that's in the pipeline? Well, what, what we're trying to say here is that um, the service that's existed for seven years and um, provided very good and at times life-saving support in times of crisis mm -hmm. for survivors of in-care abuse, that the service could enhance the new model and we are saying there is room for this, this service as it exists to transfer over uh, along with the um, trained uh, therapists. Um, we believe that there has to be room for this therapeutic model within the new broken service. The thing is about, about whether um, those accessing in care survivor service in its current form about numbers, there is likely to be an increase in those when it comes to the public inquiry, which is currently being set up, and um, I believe uh, Susan O'Brien is the um, chair of that. So, the, at the, the time of the public inquiry, um, like the National Confidential Forum and, and various bits of this in the journey, that um, survivors need support at different points in time. No. Um, Angus, to be followed by John. Thanks, um, convener. Good morning, Mr. Anderson. Uh, good morning, Mr. Daly. Um, I, I should uh, perhaps declare an interest uh, in that I've been a, a strong supporter of Open Secret um, up till now, and uh, uh, clearly Open Secret are based in, in the neighbouring constituency of Falkirk East. And I believe in recent years, um, the service they offered has uh, helped 900 survivors since 2009, uh, which uh, I believe has been a, a service second to none. Um, now, I've been aware of uh, the difficulties faced by Open Secret uh, for some time, and, and this change to the way the ICSSS is delivered will undoubtedly have an impact uh, on the charity. Um, now, since they clearly don't agree with the change in service delivery, as, as we've heard uh, this morning. Uh, they've dug their heels in and refused to, to tender for the new service because they believe the, the new broker model will significantly uh, change the, the, the type of service provided, um, particularly when you consider that none of the specialist survivor agencies with substantial experience of historic abuse have managed to secure ongoing funding. So um, I was interested to hear in, um, in the briefing that we received that uh, op given that Open Secret didn't tender for, for the new service, um, th th they've stated that survivors currently accessing ICSSS uh, delivered by Open Secret can continue to receive the, the support that they need through existing services uh, provided by Open Secret. So I'm, I'm just curious as to if, if you have had difficulties with, if Open Secret have had difficulties with their core funding, eh, and now there's been no um, attempt to tender for the new service, how are you going to be able to provide, continue to provide that service if clients ask for it? 
as I've said, um, we feel that the in care survivor service and its current model could enhance the new service, but that's not saying that they have the overall tender for the new brokering model. But it would be part of it and, and to enhance. We're looking for the, 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 the allocation of the monies to be distributed in both directions. Yes. Ah, okay. Um, now you, you mentioned. Um, I think it was Chris in, uh, in your opening remarks about the legal ownership of records, which uh, raised some concerns with me. Um, and I think you're right to have concerns if, if the records are to be uh, bandied about, for, for want of a, a better term. Um, I believe at the moment the records are held centrally by Open Secret, um, but then Open Secret will then be required to release these records to whichever agency is then taking on the, the, the case. Certainly they have been ordered to do that, but I am not sure about the legality of that. And My understanding is that the ownership of the f files is that the, that the clients, um, when I have consulted other people um, working in the field about that, about confidentiality of records and so on, um, my understanding is that um, there is no obligation by Open Secret to hand uh, these um, highly confidential um, and um, very personal uh, records of individuals over to the new brokering model. Well, I can understand the concern of, uh, of survivors if, if these files were to be released um, to, to, uh, to, to other agencies. Uh, perhaps that is something we can check, convener, when, uh, when we decide what action we are going to take. Happy to do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Daly. And as Angus MacDonald has indicated, I also am aware of the work the Open Secret has done, and given that they originally tendered seven years ago to deliver the services of ICES SSS. The question, first question I would ask is, do you know what the total cost of delivering those services over the last seven years has been uh, as part of the Open Secret contract? Well, I had asked, um, I put in a freedom of information request to the Scottish Government about facts and figures about uh, some of the costings of things. Uh, they didn't get back to me. Um, however, I found out through um, another source that the interaction process and the action plan was at a cost of £88,000 or thereabouts. Um, but I'm not entirely sure about the running costs of... Um, Open, open, uh, sorry, in care survivor service uh, via, via Open Secret. Yeah. Yep. It's just that the Cabinet Secretary, in response to a question from uh, Jackie Bailey in June last year, indicated that the Scottish Government uh, had announced a funding of £13.5 million to develop a dedicated support service for survivors of in care abuse. Uh, now, that £13.5 million, I'm just trying to, and we will determine this from further questions for the Scottish Government, how that compares to what's being provided at the present moment. Because, because like Angus MacDonald, I'm keen to see the ICSSS model continue, because clearly for the 900 users of that service, it has worked, and it provides valuable or invaluable uh, support to those seeking advice, information, help, uh, at the present time, and any change to that format would lead to disruption <coughs> and potential issues that Mr Anderson has raised in his opening remarks in relation to those uh, people who rely on that service. So has there been any discussion about ICSSS tendering for the contract to continue to deliver the services that have been delivered up till now as part of a, as I think Angus MacDonald uh, quite rightly identified a twin track approach to providing support for survivors. After discussions with uh, some of the um, development workers in Care Survivor Service Scotland and uh, survivors, we came up with a plan to say, well, there is a way that they can coexist, that we can still have in Care Survivor Service Scotland and the new brokering model and they enhance one another. 
Um, there's a sort of symbi symbiotic relationship between the two um, types of service. Um, however, we understood that from recent talks with Scottish Government that there, that there will be a full withdrawal of funding from In Care Survivor Service Scotland as Open Secret deliver it in March. There won't be any further funding. Um, but what we are seeing here and, and hoping that the, the Parliament can, can urge the Scottish Government to continue this uh, life-saving um, support service for survivors. And the, who is promoting the brokering model? Is it the Scottish Government? Is, it's, it's just the Scottish Government and that is their preferred alternative to ICSSS? Well, Scottish Government say that it came out of the interaction process through the consultation process, which, is, which was what essentially the interaction was. Um, it was us survivors, Scottish Government, people like uh, the Centre for Excellence for Looked After Children in Scotland, the Scottish Human Rights Commission, and the service providers or some of the in institutions who were implicated in the historic abuse. So basically we came to an agreement about s certain aspects of what we called remedies to in care abuse or historic abuse in Scotland. And one of the, th the things that we, we came up with was a support fund. However, after consultation, after, at the end of the interaction, Scottish Government went off and created this support service, which is different from what we feel it was different from what was consulted on and the discussions around the table at this interaction process, um, where we spoke of a support fund. Um, and some of the elements within the brokering model do include some of the discussion around uh, a family holiday fund, um, access to driving lessons um, to uh, give people a better chance of employment and so on. Some of the issues about rehabilitation and resettlement. Um, so, but we weren't specifically looking for a service. I think we were more kind of felt that we were being consulted on about a fund. I can understand that some people developing schemes to deal with uh, survivors uh, of abuse might come up with, and I think you gave the examples there of holiday funds, driving uh, money for driving lessons and things like that. I think fundamentally I'm looking for is the support, the vital support, essential support that's required for survivors. And that might not be about a holiday fund or it might not be about driving lessons. It's about having someone they can speak to, communicate with at any time of the day that they feel they need the support and the ability to actually interact with those support workers rather than be told, well, we don't have a support worker for you, but here's some money for a driving lesson. Go away and do a driving lesson. I'm just trying to have the survivors in terms of the group that you represent, Mr. Daly and Mr. Anderson, what is their view? I mean, I'm assuming their view is they would rather see ICSSS continuing to exist in its present form to provide the support that it does uh, rather than go for this kind of brokering model that uh, the Scottish Government have cobbled together is a better way to describe it. Mr Anderson. I just want to repeat, <clears throat> I think the brokering model is good for the survivors who want it and for those who need it. I remember clearly earlier last year being at meetings that were arranged by um, certain professionals. I remember attending those meetings, listening to civil servants within the Scottish Government, and been given the absolute assurance at that time that the funding would continue. I have correspondence here from my MSP, Fiona MacLeod, from Alexandra Devoy and Heather Brown, all saying at that time nothing would change. The service would continue. We believed that. I also remember being told that the councillors would keep their jobs. Now, a period of perhaps maybe two, three months more, 
we were not consulted by those agencies who invited us to those meetings about a new model that was created, such as the broker model. So when meetings were later arranged for ourselves to attend and the broker model was discussed, I'm sitting there thinking, where did that come from? That was never discussed initially. We have a new model in place, take it or leave it. And that made me feel as, excuse me, you arranged those meetings. You asked us to trust you. You asked us to confide in you and things that are very, very sensitive. Please let us help you. And we did that. So when the broker model came out, I remember being a part of those meetings. Not one person in the panel ever said anything about in-care survivors continuing in its funding. And I had to think, why not? What had changed? Because they never consulted us to say, this is what's going to happen. And it made myself and other survivors from in-care survivors who attended these meetings, why are we here? Because it's not what was discussed earlier. So my personal feeling is, in listening to other survivors who had attended those meetings, what was that about? Am I going to lose my counsellor? Am I going to lose the group work? Will the new broker model simply be a medical one where you can be assessed for CBT or psychotherapy or some other medical form? Now, most of the survivors whom I've spoken to and listened to have been... Now, I'm going to be blunt with you, but please don't take it personally. They've been rejected by the, the NHS because you're untreatable. So where's the sense in having a broker model that offers a medical approach that has also already been proven not to work for people who have borderline personality disorder, who have post-traumatic stress disorder? It would make far more sense for the councillors who've been supporting us over the past number of years to keep their jobs because we trust them. Now, on a, an issue related to this, I was one inch last year from stopping my counselling sessions. And then when we were told changes were going to happen, I had a relapse. I've been, I was suicidal twice last year. And I thought, why is this happening? So... I feel that <clears throat> myself and other survivors feel that we've been misled. We were given the assurance things would not change. And then we were told something else, take it and leave it, or leave it. So, again, this is something else that I've gathered in listening to other survivors as well. There can is I, the... Sorry, can I just add something, to, um, Mr. Wilson, about... Um, this whole consultation process, the interaction process where we discussed a support fund and so on, it was quite costly. It was £88,000. So, you know, it, it should have been, um, the outcomes should have been what we all agreed as a consensus and not simply, for want of a better term, the Scottish Government running away with the ball and setting up the broker model without further consultation. I agree with you, Mr Daly or Mr Anderson, and that's what we're trying to do, is draw out some of the issues that you feel led to you submitting a petition of this nature, because we need to know what type of questions to ask the Scottish Government, because it's the Scottish Government, clearly, that have came out with the broker model. I, my final question, Convener, if you bear with me, is just to ask, as, as you understand at the present moment, the, you've indicated that as of March uh, 2016, the funding for ICSS finishes. Uh, and while there has been this uh, agreement that they will continue to provide support, but clearly if they don't have funding coming in, they won't be able to provide that support for very long. How, when do the government intend to introduce the broker model? Is that in place at the present moment? Or is it intended to... That question, I'm right. sorry. I'm not sure when the brokering okay. model. However, um, Mr Wilson um, and the committee, it is, um, what we found was we were suddenly told there's going to be this brokering model service. And then we were told in the same breath it's out to tender. So therefore, it's currently still, they have been 
in discussions with organisations who are looking to gain the contract, um, and Scottish Government are currently uh, looking at that. So, sometime soon, I would think. Thank you. Come here. Keen to get the committee's views on how we take the petition forward. Um, there's been a suggestion already from Angus asking questions of the government. Uh, John, you've also suggested that we we ask some questions. So I, I'm assuming that everyone's agreed that we write to the government uh, to try and establish exactly uh, how we arrived at this point. But I think we also need to contact those organisations that have been mentioned by the petitioners. Um, such as Open Secret and the Scottish Human Rights Commission in order to establish exactly uh, what their take is uh, on this. There was another organisation that's been mentioned, Celsus. Um, the Centre uh, for Excellence for Looked After Children in Scotland. Yeah. It's the former uh, Scottish Institute of Residential Child Care. It's based at Strathclyde University. Yeah. It may be worthwhile uh, that we take um, their views as well on board. They, they might have an input into this that would uh, enlighten us. Angus? Yeah, thanks. In addition to uh, Celsius, I think um, given that Bernardo's helped to initiate this committee's inquiry uh, a, year and a, a year and a half ago, I think, into child sexual exploitation, uh, I think it would be good to uh, get their take on, on the current situation as well. And also, given that I've mentioned the uh, the committee's inquiry into child sexual exploitation, exploitation. I wonder if it would be appropriate to contact uh, the advisor that the committee had at that time, Dr. Sarah Nelson, uh, to try and get an objective view of the um, current situation. It's just, just throwing that in to see if it's possible. I mean, that's a very specific aspect of, of the, the yeah, abuse but, but, that you. But, 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 but clearly, the, the former advisor would have a view that um, we would. We would respect. I have no issue with that, but again, I'm just making the point that that's a, a very specific issue within yeah, the yeah. wider uh, in care uh, abuse um, issue. Uh, Hanzala, you want to make a? Uh, yes, please. Um, I just wanted. Uh, I, I get the feeling that th there's a strong suggestion that there's a fait accompli in place. I'm just wondering whether uh, that is factual. In fact, I'm wondering whether others were consulted. Um, in the absence of the, um, the, the, the just to just to clarify the situation, whether it is a fait accompli in the sense that they've not consulted anybody, or if they have consulted anybody, but it was very limited. So perhaps you could want to look at examine that. Who was consulted, and yes. if the decision has been arrived at? Indeed. Well, uh, beyond that consultation, that yeah. might be helpful. I don't know. I'll come back to you in a minute, Mr. Anderson. I'm trying to get views from the committee at the moment. John? Yeah, come here. It, it's taken us a number of years to get to where we are today. Never mind, hopefully, we can resolve issues and get a, an early resolution to this. But when writing to the Scottish Government, could I suggest we ask the Scottish Government what measures have been put in place from the withdrawal of funding to Open Secret and ICSSS in March 2006? until this broker uh, model is in place, because I'm concerned and would be extremely concerned if there was a gap in service provision for individuals who are going through this at the present moment, because there have been a number of survivors have been going through this for decades uh, to actually delay it any further and to delay the support mechanisms that are in place. And whether or not the Scottish Government would consider continuing to fund ICSSS until such times as a model that has been developed in conjunction with survivors is in place that everyone is happy to work with. Yeah, definitely worth asking questions. Mr Anderson, a last comment from you before we close. The consultation. I refer back to the meetings that myself and others were asked to attend earlier last year and given the assurance the service would continue. I also refer to the fact that about perhaps two or three months had passed and a new model was created. Now, the press have been very clever in saying that a Scottish minister has said the broker model is what survivors need. I agree with that, but where I feel there's been a failure is not consulting enough of the survivors of in-care survivors to say, is that what you need? What I feel has happened is, as a, as a result of those meetings, 
where survivors attended. The majority who attended those meetings did want the broker model. However, I'm very suspicious about who sent out the invitations to those survivors and said, perhaps, would you agree with this new model? I have no proof of that, convener, none. What I am trying to say to you is, had you been at those meetings when the broker model was discussed, and had you seen the faces of the in-care survivor service survivors, you'd be thinking, what's going on here? Because we weren't consulted enough. So naturally, those who orchestrated those meetings would naturally have the majority of the survivors saying, well, we want the broker model, but what about the in-care survivors ones? Well, they're the minority, okay? What I'm trying to say to you is, to repeat the last part on my statement here, allow the broker model and the in-care survivor service to work together. They can enhance each other and the potential for lives of being saved is, great, is likely to be the greatest that Scotland will see in its history. What we're trying to say to you, convener, is we want both of them because survivors have different needs. I've heard that point and we'll certainly ask the Scottish Government uh, for a response on that point. But thanks very much to you both for uh, coming this morning and, and bringing your petition. Uh, we'll give you the responses that we receive from the organisations we're right back to and we'll continue to uh, progress this uh, with your uh, cooperation. Okay, but thanks for this morning again. Thank you. I'll suspend again for a couple of minutes as we change witnesses. Okay, our next petition this morning is PE1597 by Bill Welsh on mycoplasma fermentans and regressive autism. Uh, members have a note from the clerks, the petition itself and a spice briefing on the issue. And this morning uh, Mr Welsh is joined by his constituency MSP Ken McIntosh who I will give an opportunity to make a contribution at some point after we hear from Mr Welsh. Uh, you have a few minutes to introduce the petition, Mr Welsh, uh, over to you and then we'll discuss the issues that you've raised with us. Good morning. Morning. And thanks very much for inviting me to contribute to this petitions committee. I have actually been here three times before, uh, always on the same subject or general subject, autism and uh, the relationship of MMR vaccine to autism. From 1998 to about 2005, thousands of parents marched, protested, campaigned in the UK and other countries regarding their child's withdrawal, gradual withdrawal into autistic spectrum disorder following vaccination, particularly the MMR vaccine. As honorary president of a Scottish autism charity, I was personally involved in five marches in this city, Edinburgh, 
one march in Glasgow and a very big event in London in which over 10,000 parents attended. At the end of that march, six of us were invited into 11 Downing Street, myself and five mothers of autistic children. Alistair Darling asked us the question, do you think MMR vaccines implicated in autism? He received the answer, yes, six times. No action followed that meeting in London. However, the public health bodies with the pharmaceutical industry went into publicity overdrive. The public were assaulted in the media with over 35 epidemiological studies from every which were Denmark, Finland, Sweden, Japan. What the public health bodies omitted to tell the media or politicians was that epidemiology is not appropriate for establishing causation. Let me quote from The Lancet. Causal, causal association cannot be established by data from observational research alone. And if the mechanism of a disease, the mechanism, if the mechanism is poorly understood, data from epidemiological research just cannot be used as the sole evidence to deny a causal link. The highly respected Cochrane Institute pitched in with the comment, the design and reporting of safety outcomes of MMR are inadequate. I'd like to illustrate this, I'll call it trickery, using epidemiology, with an example from the Scottish Parliament in 2001. A debate was called on single vaccines as a choice to MMR. Malcolm Chisholm, the then Deputy Health Minister, informed the Parliament that the MR, MMR safety was confirmed by a Finnish study, which had followed up to 1.8 million children. And its conclusion was... No cases of autism were associated with MMR during this 14-year follow-up. The Finnish study is rightly infamous as an example of how epidemiology can be used or misused for deceptive purposes. In fact, only 187 children were tracked, not 1.8 million children. And when Heike Paltola, the author of the Finnish study, was asked to identify, was asked, was his study designed, this was on BBC, was your study designed to identify cases of autism? He replied, no. The study was irrelevant. The BMA and five royal colleges used that irrelevant study to mislead the Scottish public and this parliament. In short, I get to this point, in short, the health bodies did not and still have not looked at the issue of a vaccine autism link. It has been deemed by the medical hierarchy that autistic spectrum disorder is solely genetic and, and it's a solely genetic condition. I provided you gentlemen with a graph. Please look at the graph. It reveals the growing number of school children with an autism diagnosis over the last 25 years. It will reach a total of one quarter of a million school children in a few years time. This is not genetics at work. The issue then entered a new phase, denial. Better recognition was regularly wheeled out. Many of these children cannot talk or have severe communication problems. And what we are being told was that prior to 1990, doctors did not recognize that a child could not talk. Parents didn't recognize it. Teachers didn't recognize it. Since the very beginning, the public health bodies have demonstrated an entrenched reluctance to even contemplate that vaccination may be impl implicated in what we are witnessing. Changing diagnostic criteria, another favourite. Even though the changes in the diagnostic criteria were designed to reduce the numbers of children with being diagnosed, again, please look at the graph. Do you think that tinkering with the diagnosis would create the massive rise in autism that we are witnessing? Meantime, in the USA, in 2011, a robust and rigorous twin study was published, the CAT study, California Autism Twin Study. It concluded that at least 65% of autism is caused by an environmental factor. This revelation received no publicity. 
I decided to do my own research. I started with my grandson's MMR vaccine batch number. I then accessed the records from the MMR court case in London. I discovered that another 17 child litigants had the same vaccine batch number as my grandson. All were diagnosed autistic. I contacted a friend in Warrington and asked him to access his son's batch number. A different number, but the same story. 27 children had received that batch number. All were diagnosed autistic. I investigated the history of vaccine batch contamination and I found important evidence in veterinary vaccines where concerns have been raised for many years. Recontamination with mycoplasma fermentans. A contamination associated, associated with cell culture technology. Mycoplasma fermentans is a bacterial pathogen. It is invisible to the naked eye. It lives within the host. It has an affinity to the cilia and the stereocilia, the, the, stereocilia, the small hairs that exist in all mammals. If mycoplasma fermentans enters the body, it will lodge in an area of cilia, like the auditory tract or the brainstem or the gut. And from there, it will invade other cells and scavenge, causing gradual deterioration in the host. Please, I, I ask you, read my scientific paper. It's been peer reviewed, it's been published. I then reread Leo Kanner, Dr. Leo Kanner's original research paper from 1943 in the USA, where he had identified the first 11 children with a new, very rare, I'm quoting Kanner, a new and very rare condition, which he named autism. Interestingly, seven of the children were thought to have been deaf. This is a very common feature in the children that we've seen today. More interestingly, cell culture technology was introduced to vaccine manufacture in the USA in 1930, shortly before these children were born. Kanner's very rare autism is now more common than all other serious childhood conditions combined, following the introduction of a vaccine using cell culture technology multiplied by three, the MMR, think synergy. Mycoplasma fermentans is difficult to detect. It does not remain in the blood. It is intracellular. It has no side walls, which makes it resistant to many antibiotics. And that is where the problem of quality control in vaccine manufacture probably began. My early hypothesis on the cause of regressive autism was placed on the internet by a parent. It was accessed quickly by parents in 45 countries worldwide. There's an awful lot of better recognition going on. I also contacted by email a number of universities. So far only one has responded and I'll read the response. I'm afraid the College of Medical, Veterinary and Life Sciences at the University of Glasgow has a strict set of research priorities. Your area of interest is not one of those. these. I wish you every success in your work. What set of research priorities in any civilised country ignores the cries of a quarter of a million sick children? In view of the attitude of public health to this tragedy affecting our children, I am requesting that the Scottish Government directly commission a research project and inform universities that funds will be made available. I estimate that my hypothesis can be tested using PCR and MSA tests on a sample of, say, 100 children at a total cost of under £100,000, with potential future savings to the government of billions of pounds. And the vaccination programme could be made safe at long last. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, uh, Mr Welsh. I mean, I, I certainly always feel at ease discussing these types of petitions because I'm not a scientist, I'm not a geneticist, and I'm relying basically on the... I'm not a scientist either. I, I, I'm relying on the scientific evidence that's available. Isn't, you, you raised in, in your uh, contributions the, the point that, that when someone put information up on the internet, it was accessed by people in 45 countries quite quickly. Do those 45 countries um, use the MMR vaccine? It's a, uh, vaccination generally because it's not, this isn't specifically MMR it's mainly MMR but there are other vaccines which are manufactured this way using cell culture technology 
Um, but yes, the 45 countries will use the MMR vaccine. I'm just wondering then if what we're having here is, is a chicken and egg situation. Um, are people looking to try and establish that MMR is the, the cause of this or, or is MMR the cause of this and people are looking for information around it? Um, is it not the case that the person who first made the link between MMR and autism has himself been discredited quite substantially in the, the work that he did and therefore any link between MMR and the autism has been, you know, in, in scientific terms, been completely uh, re haven't looked rejected? At it. No, they haven't looked at it. I'm sorry. The, the, the Dr. Wakefield, who was a chap who was, uh, who was uh, uh, discredited, as you put it, in actual fact, he visited this parliament at my invitation and spoke in uh, probably this room uh, to quite a number of MSPs. He has been struck off. He has been exiled. And he's been struck off in exile because he, he, he mentioned the MMR in his, uh, in his research. But in actual fact, this is a, what I'm presenting to you is a different hypothesis altogether. I, I think Wakefield was actually a very decent man. But I think when the original court case in London took place, I don't think they went down the right route. I think the, 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 the decisions were taken to go down a particular route when perhaps they should have stepped back, sat for a year, looked at it and looked at it until they come up with something like my hypothesis, which, which answers all the questions which we may ask about how autism may be being created in our society. But it wasn't discredited. I mean, that's just, that's just part of the propaganda. If, if, you, if you mention, I'm telling you that the public health bodies have not looked at this issue, but, and our doctors won't look at it because they know what happened to Wakefield, as you know what happened to Wakefield, and they don't want it to happen to them. I hope not to... Uh, Ken McIntosh, do you want to make a comment at the moment before we, we open it up to other members? I don't see any other indication from colleagues that they want to, to come in at this present time. But Thank you, Thanks for the opportunity to join you this morning. Uh, can I ask uh, you, Bill, just um, is there any work going on in Scotland to, to try and understand the, the rise? The, the, there is a statistically uh, measured rise, uh, steep rise, in the prevalence of autism in Scotland. What explanations are being offered for that, and is there any work or research underway currently to try and explain or understand that? Well, the, the explanations being offered are mentioned in my, in my little speech there, that better recognition, wider diagnostic criteria. Th these are all spurious excuses. They can't, you can't explain a rise like that. You cannot explain it without looking at environmental factors. And the, the, po the problem we have, and the problem guys like me have, and parents have, is that the medical profession are determined to look at autism and put it in this genetic basket. It's in a box called genetics. And they seem to have incredible difficulty in, in accepting that it's now been proved in America that 65% of autism is not genetic. It's caused by an environmental factor. And then the fear arises that, oh gosh, we're back to the MMR again. But we never ever resolved the MMR issue. We looked at one hypothesis, and I spoke to Wakefield, and, he said, and Dr. Wakefield said, mine is only one hypothesis. Well, here's another hypothesis. But I think, and, and maybe just me, but I think mine is more persuasive than uh, Dr. Wakefield's was. So can I ask, um, what, do you think the, what do you think the committee should do and the Scottish Parliament should do to uh, investigate further? Well, we've got to try and find some way of getting the, the public health bodies to, to recognise there's a problem here. I, I, you've all got constituencies. You must know there's a problem. If you speak to schools, anybody in education, they know there's a problem. And parents will tell us a problem. But we cannot move the public health bodies through to say, well, look, there's a hypothesis. So let's examine this. So let's look at this. Because I mentioned one word. I put one word in my hypothesis, and it closes all the doors. And that one word is vaccination. Apparently, vaccination is sacrosanct. You're not supposed to question vaccination. But I'm afraid if we're damaging thousands, hundreds of thousands of children, we really should be questioning whether the vaccination programme is implicated in this in some way and seriously questioning it. And do you think that, uh, do you think that autism uh, is treatable? I think if, if well, I've got to be very cautious about this answer, Ken. Uh, if my hypothesis is correct and Regressive autism, I use the word regressive all the time, regressive autism is caused by a bacterial infection, a contamination, then yes, it should be treatable. Certainly if you catch it very early, it should be treatable. I've been 
I, I've been in contact with a pharmaceutical company in the United States, and I spoke to the owner of the company, and they are developing a, a, a macrolide, it's called. And I've been following this for a number of years, and I asked them if the macrolide they were developing would be effective against mycoplasma fermentans, the contamination which I've identified. And they said, very effective. But they asked me to contact the, the scientist in Australia who was trialling it. And I contacted the, the scientist in Australia, and he said, yes, this is very effective against mycoplasma fermentans. So the answer to your question is, yes, I think this is treatable. For the children who have had this uh, bacteria inside their body for the last 20 years or so, I'm not too sure you know, how effective we can be there. But for children who start to regress into autism and we catch it early, yes, I think it could be 100% effective for them. Any questions from colleagues? Or we just have suggestions on how we take forward the petition? Can you just John? one <coughs> question for Mr. Welsh? Rather than trying to, and it's important that we try and resolve the problem that's already there and identified with children with autism, but what work should be being done to try and avoid the bacteria getting into the vaccination system in the first place and into the, the body? Well, I, I think that uh, my, my research in the United States, which I just mentioned, looking at the development of this macrolide, that is the answer for the vaccination manufacturers because that macrolide, if it was added to their quality control, would eliminate any possibility of uh, mycoplasma fermentans being in the vaccine, in my understanding of the situation. Because the, the, this particular contaminant can't be 100% removed using the, the antibiotics that they use just now. So yes, in, in trying to help the children, I think we can also help the vaccination programme. I think that's important too, to make the vaccination programme safe. Tackle the if you're saying that it gets into the system through the vaccination process, then by actually tackling that process and making sure that we eliminate the bacteria before it gets into the vaccination system, that then we're not then having to do the follow-up work once it's been identified uh, and individuals once they identified as having autism, uh, because it, and it's trying to, I know what you're trying to do is get the, man, the pharmaceutical companies and governments to understand we should be doing everything we can to prevent the, the getting in the, into the system rather than have it dealing with it once it's already in the, the system. That's absolutely correct. We, we, it shouldn't be in, in the system at all. And I think since 1930, it's been in the system in a, in a small way. Now we probably have the means in the quality control part of, of manufacturing vaccines. We have the ability, I would think, to, to make that. In actual fact, that would, if, if the vaccine manufacturers were to look at that, then the, the, the rate of autism would descend and we would have some sort of proof that that was, that was the cause in the first place. But by the main drive, I was president, or only president of a, of a children's charity in Edinburgh for, for many years. The main drive that I focus on is trying to help the children who have been damaged because the heartbreak involved in that is quite frankly uh, unbearable at times. It, it's terrible when you see these kids, perfect kids, kids that could sing, kids that could talk and can no longer do so, losing, losing all their skills. And I think that's still the main drive for me. I'll open up to colleagues to suggest what we do. I mean, I think the question is, is there any way we can get some scientific analysis of this? The best place to start is to talk to the scientists. So I think we need to talk to the, the chief scientific officer and ask what the, the position is. There, I, because I was refused the audience from uh, the, the Minister for Health, or a, a series of Ministers for Health, I was, they kept diverting me. And one of the places they diverted me to was the chief scientific officer. And I, it was one of the poorest uh, and least successful interviews in 20 years of fighting this particular problem because the chap hadn't even read my hypothesis. So was that, I'm not, I'm, I've respect, lost confidence in, in an awful yeah. lot of the, the official bodies involved in this. With, with all due respect, we're not asking him to review your work. We're asking, I, I'm suggesting that we write to him and ask about what work needs to be done in order to uh, take forward the petition if it's possible to do that. And it's not exactly the same 
um, question that, that you, uh, you were asking. Yeah. So no, I'm sorry, I can answer that question for you yeah. because he told me I would have to get a, a university to make an application to him that I, as an ordinary citizen, w w they didn't want to know about me. And I went to the universities and I've got read to you what the first reply I've had from a university. Well, no, no, it's not one of our priorities. How do we change that? Well, so I'm trying to find a way of... I know, you're trying to help me. And I'm you're <laughs> telling me not to do it. So I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure that talking well, away... I'm, not, I'm uh, not telling you not to do it. I'm just saying my experience. <laughs> right, well, in, in which case, then, we'll, we'll do it then and see if we can get a different response to the committee than, than you might have done to, to a member of the public. Um, we'll, we'll start uh, from that point of view. Anyone else? Jackson, do you want to...? Uh, a couple of uh, suggestions, uh, convener. Um, Mr. Welsh has supplied a graph which extrapolates the incidence um, using a methodology in the United Kingdom. I would be interested to know if we could contact the Euro Department of Health in the, Euro in the European Parliament to see what the uh, emerging incidence uh, uh, of is across other countries within the European Union to see whether that is part of a similar pattern. Um, and or because that may or may not um, validate the suggestion about extended uh, uh, diagnosis through different means, depending on the trend. Because if it is related in some way to the vaccine, then the trend ought to be absolutely parallel and not unique. Um, secondly, I noticed obviously the petitioner submitted a petition in March 2000, following which there was an expert group that at that point concluded um, that there wasn't uh, uh, sufficient evidence to support the hypothesized link between MR vaccine and autism. And I know this has been a subject of public discussion and concern over the years. That obviously now is at least, you know, potentially up to 16 years ago. And I would be interested to know from the Scottish Government um, whether at any point they have sought to establish on an ongoing basis uh, whether there is any further evidence or uh, information that has been received which would allow a second expert group at some point to consider anything afresh um, or whether in fact current practice simply relies upon the sort of views that were taken at that point. Questions to ask of the government? Any other suggestions? Okay. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to make suggestions. But, yeah, you can. Uh, uh, can, can I suggest um, that Rather than, than simply just asking for the chief scientists and the um, government's view on one hypothesis, either for or against, that we ask them what they're doing about um, the rise in autism and the prevalence uh, of ASD, of regressive autism. Just to, uh, and for them to say specifically, do they believe that this is simply a question of better diagnosis? It can be explained entirely by better diagnosis uh, and... Um, that there is, uh, and further, are they conducting any research? Are they looking at this matter, uh, you know, putting aside, not putting aside, but, you know, not questioning um, the link with MMR or um, Bill's hypothesis, but are they conducting any other research themselves uh, into this matter or are they looking, considering such? It's entirely legitimate, yeah. It's probably yeah. worth asking that of the Department of Health. Then, I would have thought so, the, yeah. uh, Scottish Health. Okay. So there's a series of questions that we need to ask in, in relation to what uh, you brought to us this morning, Mr. Welsh. Thanks very much for bringing your petition. Uh, we'll collate the responses that we get and, and get them to you, and uh, you can comment on them, and we'll take the petition forward uh, once we have all that information uh, gathered together. But thanks again this morning for coming in front of us. Thank you very Thank much you. for inviting me. Thank you. I'll suspend again for a couple of minutes till we...
Our next petition this morning is PE 1599 by Richard Morris on adult consensual incest or ECI. Members have a note from the clerk, the petition and the spice briefing. Um, I think everyone's had a chance to read this. Um, normally, we would ask the, the Scottish Government for its position on, on these, uh, any pet, uh, petition unless there are extenuating circumstances. And I think that given that the Scottish Law Commission uh, conducted a report on this uh, as near uh, as 2007, I would suggest to the committee that under Rule 15.7 of the Standing Orders on the basis that the majority view at that time um, concluded that uh, there was a favour in retaining the offence uh, and the current definition, that there isn't any value uh, in taking this petition forward because I can't see that that position would have changed um, in the, the intervening period. I have no indication at all that there is any uh, desire to see that change, um, but I am open to uh, committee members to either agree or disagree with me. Convenient, I am happy yeah. to support your suggestion. Jackson. Yes, uh, having read the detail of the petition, I do not think an argument is made that would justify a public interest being served in this petition continuing. I think everyone agrees that, so on that basis I will close the, the petition. Okay, that concludes our new petitions this morning. Uh, we go to agenda item two, which is consideration of continued petitions. The first of which is PE 1412 by Bill McDowell on bonds of caution. Uh, members of a note from the so I, I keep pronouncing that wrong, it's Cation. <laughs> um, so members have a note from the, the clerk um, to have views on, on how we, we take this petition forward. Kenny? The consultation ended in September of last year. I think we should be asking the government where they're going with it. I think we could try and get some understanding of the direction of travel before we take a final decision. Yeah. Members happy with that? Okay. Our uh, next petition is PE1431 by Nick Ridderford on behalf of the Fair Isle community on a marine protected area for Fair Isle. Again, members have the submissions uh, from, and the note from the clerk. Um, again, Angus, up to yourself. Yes, thanks, Convener. I think given the Scottish Government's uh, announcement on MPAs uh, under Rule 15.7, uh, I think we should close the petition. Um, on the basis that the proposal meets the criteria in the MPAs that have been announced. Thank you, John. Just a, a note, convener, to say this is uh, another successful petition for the Petitions Committee. Uh, it's clearly through the discussions arising from the submission of this petition with uh, the Scottish Government officials and others uh, that this action has now been taken. So I think uh, it once again proves that the Petitions Committee can have a role to play in making decisions that impact upon communities throughout Scotland. Well, it's good to pat ourselves on the back, isn't it? Well, we should do <laughs> when we can, can we? Yeah, thanks, John. <laughs> OK, so we, we close the petition on the basis that Angus has suggested. That's agreed? Yeah. Agreed. OK. Our next petition, 1477 by Jamie Ray on behalf of Throat Cancer Foundation on gender-neutral HPV vaccine. Members will recall that this petition was deferred from our last meeting to allow the petitioner to submit further information to the committee. This information has now been received and has been circulated uh, along with a note from the clerk. So, Angus. Thanks, Convener. I think given that the petitioner has raised his concerns that the JCVI is taking too long uh, to issue guidance on the matter, I think we should keep the petition open. Uh, and I think we should write to the JCVI uh, passing on the petitioner's concerns and to ask for an update on the current situation uh, regarding extending HPV <coughs> vaccinations to all boys and can we seek in addition can we seek uh, information in particular on the time frame for Public Health England uh, to undertake its modelling which incidentally I believe has just received or, or has been awarded uh, extra funding to complete the work and whether the JCVI has a time scale for when it thinks it will be able to make a recommendation on whether to extend the, the vaccine to all boys. I think that's a particularly legitimate question that we should ask. Members agreed? Agreed. Okay. Our next petition is PE1493 by Peter John Gordon on a Sunshine Act for Scotland. 
Again, members have a note from the clerk and the submissions that we received. Um, should we go back to the government and ask them to advise on the outcome of the consultation and whether it's minded to introduce a searchable register of interest in the form uh, that's suggested by the petitioner? Yeah. yeah, I think we do. Okay, so that's agreed. The next one is PE1517 by Elaine Holmes and Olive McElroy on behalf of the Scottish Mesh Survivors. Here our voice campaign on mesh medical devices. Um, Neil Finlay, MSP, and John Scott, MSP, who have uh, indicated an interest in this uh, petition, uh, can't be with us this morning, uh, but they have indicated that they are continuing their support. Um, I think there's, there's been more evidence that's been brought out about these uh, um, uh, the treatments, and I just think that we need to pursue this uh, a lot further. And, uh, I think we we need to ask the, the Cabinet Secretary uh, to ensure that the work of the ex expert group is made more transparent and to respond to the committee on how this transparency is going to be delivered. Um, we, I think we also need an update on whether the discussions have taken place with those involved in the trials in light of the findings of the interim report. And given that we now get uh, litigation apparently in America, um, about three types of mesh that's been used, I think there's a lot more that needs to be understood about this situation because it, you know, I think that the committee has been greatly moved by the, the evidence we've heard so far, but it, it keeps emerging and I think we need to keep asking questions. So we'll continue to do that if members agree. Okay, Jackson. Can I also ask, in view of the most recent revelations uh, emerging that material not fit for the purpose of being used in a, with humans has potentially been included within uh, mesh implants that may well have been used within Scotland, I would be interested in the Scottish Government's uh, reaction to that and also uh, whether, in fact, that might prompt them to further conversations with the MHRA, uh, who have, to this committee, previously asserted the safety of these devices, uh, and what further conversations the, or investigations the MHRA are making in the light of this information. Uh, John? Following up from Jackson Carlow's comments about MHRA, could I... I uh, suggest we, when we write to the Scottish Government, we ask them about the views expressed by the petitioners about establishing Scotland's own independent medical watchdog because of the concerns that have been raised. Uh, and as Jackson Carlo quite rightly said, some of the evidence we heard from MHRA clearly didn't uh, enamour some of the committee members at the time when we heard that evidence. So it would be useful just to rate, flag that up to the Government. Uh, the call for an independent medical watchdog uh, yeah. to be established. Well, so at least ask their, their views as to whether that's uh, being considered or considered viable. That's uh, definitely worth considering. Okay, so that's a, a few things that, that we've noted we want to pursue, so I think everyone's agreed that we do that. Yep. Our next petition is PE1575 by Alex Scott, MBE, on accessible rail travel. Uh, members of a note from the clerk and the submissions. Uh, what members think we've taken this as far as we, we can? Yeah. I think we should consider closing it. We, can we agree we close it on the basis of the responses that we received? Okay, thanks. And the action is underway, under yeah. Uh, the next one is PE1578 by Martin Keatings on a fourth circle rail link. Again, members have the paperwork that's accompanying this. Again, the responses seem to address what was raised in the petition, so on that basis we close it. Okay. The next one is PE1578 by Duncan Wright on behalf of Safe Scotland School Libraries on saving uh, those facilities in our, our schools. Uh, again, the paper works in front of everyone. I'm not sure that we can close this one. I think there's a bit of work to be done on this one yet. <laughs> uh, so I think uh, writing to the Association of Directors of Education in Scotland to ask whether we consider leading on the production of a national strategy for school libraries and writing to COSLA again to seek its views on the petition and to comment on reports that several local authorities are cutting back 
on school library pr provision. Jackson. Of concern, can because I, this is something in which I'm continuing as a regional member in the west of Scotland to receive representations from school librarians uh, who very much feel that, and without trying to get into the politics of it, but that the pressures on uh, local authority spending are finding the library service in schools as a first and easy option for reductions in expenditure and the loss of expertise, the talk about uh, a reduction in staff and them having to be shared across various school libraries there, all of which is a diminution of a service in an area of education which I think everybody would accept is fundamentally important, yeah. the ability to enjoy reading. So I, I do think that it would be... Um, it, it, it would be interesting to try and collate, if, I don't know who we would make, in specifically to COSLA, what they can tell us about um, their understanding of uh, the likely shape of the number of librarians employed across Scotland's local authorities during the course of the next year, uh, if, if what, what many constituents are writing to me tell me is true. Legitimate question. I well, COSLA does collate that information, but we can certainly ask. But I think anyone, with, obviously, since this petition uh, came in front of us, uh, I've taken a bit of a, an interest in, in watching the media about how the budgets that are being proposed by local authorities are, are looking at this type of issue. And it appears to be that almost every uh, article that you read, one of the targets for the cuts is, is the libraries. Uh, I suppose it's understandable because it's an easy hit um, and, and we do understand the pressure that local authorities are under. But I'm increasingly of the view that it's a false economy which will undermine the educational system if we don't protect our libraries much better than, than we currently are. So I think we have to get to the bottom of this and just establish you know, how much uh, the impact of the budget cuts is having on our school libraries because it's a, a vitally important issue as the petitioner uh, made us all aware when they, they presented the petition. So I think we have a bit of work to do uh, to try and ensure that we are looking at this issue and, and trying to promote the petition in the best way that we can. Okay. I think everyone agrees that we should do that. And our final uh, petition this morning is PE1582 by Karen Harvey on compulsory pet insurance. Um, I think we have to close it. It was an interesting one, but I think the responses that came back don't surprise us. Um, so I don't really think there's much more we can do in terms of, of taking that issue forward. But I, I do thank the petitioner for bringing an interesting petition in front of us. It was worthy of consideration. Okay, that's the end of our uh, public session this morning. So I'll close the meeting and thanks everyone for their attendance. Thank you.